Good morning, my name is Kyle Gatlin, one of your pastors, and I have a question before you. Have any of you ever heard of Takatsubo cardiomyopathy? Anybody ever heard of that before? Anybody? Yeah. I, fig I figured a couple doctors would. So did I pronounce it close to right, Bert? Did I actually get close? Any anyway, so what happens is, is because of emotional or some, some kind of stressors, uh, big emotional stressors on the heart, it weakens quickly, right? And of course, you know, a weakened heart means something's wrong, right? And what happens is when this, this happens to people, they think it's a heart attack and they'll go present to the ER or to the doctor or whatever. And about 2% of the people that present for a heart attack, it's actually this, this Takutsubo cardiomyopathy. Aren't you glad you came today? So, it's actually, they, they actually think it's a little bit, maybe a little bit higher than 2% because sometimes it is mixed diagnosed. You know what the common word for this is? Broken heart syndrome. Broken heart syndrome. And, and you can imagine uh, stressors when, when somebody's grieving. Uh, losing someone quickly or tragically or whatever, this is a real thing, right? It presents as a real thing. And, and I got thinking about this a little bit, and I'm going like, okay, what breaks God's heart? What breaks God's heart? And we could probably go through a litany of things that breaks God's heart, Right? Like all the people that went to a game yesterday that didn't go to church today, that may I just had to get that dig. Anyway, all right. So we can go through all that, but really it's pretty simple. It's a very simple answer. You know what breaks God's heart? When we break his covenant. When we break the covenant. Now, some some of you have, have heard this story before, but the reason that this name Covenant came to this church is because the founding pastor, Mike Watson, and he mentioned this, and, and, and uh, the, the Tommy and Kathy Peacock said it in a video that some of you have seen, that when they were looking for a church name back in 79, Mike came back with, hey, you know this word Covenant is mentioned 280 times, approximately, give or take a few, depending on translation, right? 280 times the word covenant is mentioned in the Bible. And what we, what we see in this word covenant is that, that when God is, is dealing with his people, it's called a covenant. It's a covenant with Abraham. It is a covenant with David. It's, it's a covenant with Noah. It's a covenant with with Moses. And actually, we're going to look at the covenant with Moses. Look at this. This is God's talking. God and Moses are chit-chatting. And God, and he says this. This is in Exodus 19. Now, if you obey me fully, this is God talking to Moses, and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back, summoned the elders of the people, set before them all the words the Lord has commanded him to speak. In other words, exactly what that just said. And the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. Famous last words. Famous last words. You want to know how long it took for them to forget the covenant they had just made? 40 days. For 40 days. Give or take a day. Because we get this in Exodus 32. And then the Lord says to Moses, go down because your people... Wait a second, God, didn't you just say these were your people? Wait a second. Your people... Go down to your people. Sort of like when... When my kid messes up, it's my wife's child, right? Y'all done that before? All right. Actually, most of the time, it's my wife telling me, that's your son. That's true. Anyway, go down, to Mo go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have, come, have become corrupt. 
They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. In other words, what they said they were going to do, they didn't do. They'd already gone away from that. And then we see this cycle literally over and over again. And, and if you're reading with us through the Old Testament, you've gone through some stuff that you can't remember half of the stuff that you read, but you, you can see generally this cycle over and over again that we see the people, God makes a covenant with them, they break the covenant many times. And you know what else we see? We see God's unbroken love from a broken heart. Over and over we see that God has an unbroken love, but it's coming, coming from a broken heart. Because that broken heart has come from the broken covenant. But yet he still has that unbroken love. And in fact, from this point where they made the bales in Exodus 32 all the way up to Joshua 21, we have like five huge, huge disappointments. About five major incidences where the people did like this. They made idols or they just did some major stupid stuff, okay, in that time. But you know what happens? Even after those five major incidences, and this all took place within about 50 years now, because that was the wilderness experience too, right? Wilderness experience going into the promised land too. In Joshua 21, we read this. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of them, their enemies, withstood them. The Lord gave them, gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Wait a second, God. These people kept breaking your covenant and breaking your covenant, but you kept yours. You kept yours. That, that unbroken love from that broken heart. He continued to love his people. Through all of that, through all of that. Well, that's sort of the overarching thing, but I want to read you the psalm, Psalm 89, and, and remind you of one thing. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity, iniquity with flogging. So guess what? There's, there's stuff coming. There's consequences, right? But wait, wait for this. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Hmm. That, that's, that's this unbroken love from a broken heart. But here we see... And if you've been reading through the, the, the Bible with us up to this point, there are consequences. When the covenant is broken, there are consequences. It doesn't mean that the love stops. It's unbroken love, but there's still consequences. Our, our children, our children really, really sort of get back at us some way. They, they sort of get into sort of this deal where, if you've experienced this before, where your, your kid or your grandkid, grandkid, never mind, grandkids don't mess up. All right, so when, your kid, when your kid messes up and, and they make a bad decision or they make a mistake, that, that really it was a stupid thing, right? And then you have to do something for them to learn. In, in other words, there are consequences for this bad decision. There's consequences for this mistake. And when you start punishing them, or whatever that punishment is, whether it's corporal punishment, whether it's taking away something, or letting them not do something, whatever it is, 
Did you ever get this back? You just don't love me. Did you get that? You just don't love me. You're just mean, right? You don't love me anymore. All right, for this crowd, I thought of this story. Actually, it's a TV show. And, uh, and I think many of you will get this. One of you will not. But anyway, <laughs> I'm looking at your daughter, Bobby. She won't. <laughs> no. Okay. Andy Griffith Show. Pretty much everybody but Ron Howard has deceased from that show. That's how old it is. There was a show early, in, early on. This was early on called The Spoiled Kid. Arnold Winkler. Arnold Winkler was the brand new kid in town, had the brand new shiny bike, and he was running that bike everywhere, right? He was running over old ladies. And he was also getting a 75 cents allowance a week. Whoa. It was a big deal because Opie only got 25 cents. Well, the story it basically is this spoiled kid was used to getting away with everything. His daddy would get, bought him the bike, gave him 75 cents for doing nothing. And in the end, when Andy held them responsible and took away his bike, he just blew up. He just blew up. This kid blew up, and his father realized that he is not doing this kid any favors, favors by giving, giving in to him. And, and, and he, he, he finally figured out, my kid needs to face the consequences. And Andy's famous last words to him was, we have a woodshed out back. <laughs> a good old-fashioned woodshed? Yes, sir. And he lost the bike, and Arnold lost the bike. You see, we, we had learned, most of us as parents have learned that if, if, we can, if our kids can face the consequences of bad mistakes and bad decisions early on in life, it's going to save them a lot more devastating consequences later in life. We, we have learned that. And, and those of us that have not learned that are setting our kids up for some hard lessons later in life. Hosea ends up being a poster child for what consequences look like. Hosea begin, be, is actually the poster child for, for God saying, this is the consequence, Israel, for what you're doing. This is the consequence for the broken uh, covenant that you have, have, have broken. Have, have you made these choices, all right? So here, here we have this model of the consequences, but we also have the model of what? Of the unbroken love for the broken promise. So Hosea 1-2, we began this. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So in other words, Israel had, had broken the covenant... They were unfaithful to God. They had broken the covenant. So he married Gomer, daughter of the blame. So, uh, so Hosea had a built-in excuse for everything. Her daddy's to blame. All right. All right, so here's an aside. Here's an aside. Why was Gomer Pyle named Gomer after the story? We have the lady named Gomer. Anyway, so, okay. That's just, that's just an aside. Anyway, that's my Andy Griffith tie-in. Did y'all see that? Did y'all catch it? Anyway, all right. So here's the deal. Hosea ended up marrying this, this lady, Gomer. And they had three children. They had three children. The first one was named Jezreel which actually, by, by definition of the, the, of the word, means God sows. Now, here's what I also know about Jezreel, because in, in, Hosea's, in, in Hosea, we're not going to read it, but basically he talks about Jezreel because that was a, a place where there was bloodshed, where, where there was a massacre that Jehu, King Jehu had taken out on the family of Ahab but he had taken it to such extremes 
that God really wasn't pleased with him. He had sort of gone over and beyond the, the fact of punishing the family of Ahab. You know, basically Ahab's wife Jezebel was the one who was needing the, the consequences dealt to her, but the rest of them, it, it just went far beyond. So there was a lot of bloodshed. And, and, and basically he's saying for Israel, this is going to be the same thing. That there's going to be consequence for going too far. There's going to be consequence. There's going to be bloodshed for you as, as a country. That's, that's sort of what, what this, this living parable of Hosea's life is, is the first thing he talks about. Was the first one's named Jezreel to remind the people, hey, there's consequences, but there's also there's going to be some bloodshed. Then they had another child named Lo Ruhema, and that literally means not loved. Not loved. Can you imagine going to school and the teacher says, uh, Lo Ruhema? <laughs> Your parents must not like you, right? to name you as not loved. Not loved. Then another child, lo, ami, not my people. And how would you like that? Going to, going to school and, and, and your name literally means you're not part of my family. Having a child and having, having these names, I can't imagine. Can't imagine. I also can't imagine the, the ridicule that Hosea may have gotten when he married this lady that everybody knew about. Can you imagine some of the comments that he even got when these kids were born? And that, that some of them are going, you sure that's yours? Looks like the goat milkman's kid to me. So. But it was a living parable. This is, this is the, the little, little words of these kids, the names of these kids meant that this, this was not good for the nation of Israel. There's, there's going to be bloodshed. You're not going to be loved and you're not my people. Why? Because you have broken the promise. You have broken the covenant. But this quickly turns in Hosea verse 10. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. So I'm going to stop right there. So he, he, he's, he's saying, okay, this unbroken love is there from God. Because these both two nations, remember the nations are divided, so the southern kingdom, northern kingdom. And he's saying, and Hosea is telling the people, hey, guess what? You're coming back together. You're coming back together. And that there will be a great day of Jezreel. But wait a second, Jezreel is a bloodshed. This is the opposite of that. This is when it comes back to the name meaning God sows. That God sows. And this is where that meaning means God is giving a new life. To his people. This unbroken love for the for people for, for from his broken heart, he's gonna give new life to them. Why? We see that in the next verse. In that day, you will call your brothers a me, which is my people, and you will call your sisters Ru Haima, the ones I love. So I'm going to sow great things. I'm going to sow something wonderful. It's going to be life-giving now to these people, to you people, you Israelites, my people. I'm going to sow new life into you. Why? Because you are my people. You are the ones that I love because I've promised my love to you. Even though my heart is broken, my love for you will never be broken. He's giving life. We can't get into the all, all of Hosea, but we're going to hit a couple more. Hosea 3, listen to this. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. 
Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethek of barley. <laughs> Understand this. After Gomer had these kids, apparently she left. So she, she broke the promise to, to Hosea, which is sort of standard operating procedure for her, because she sold out. She sold out, most likely into slavery. He had to buy her back. But did, did, did you catch what God told Hosea? He said, I want you to buy her back, but show love to her. Show love to her. Now, on a surface level, when, when we're reading this story, we're probably in our minds thinking, you've got to be crazy. If this was my spouse and they did this to me, no way. And, and even if I did... I would buy the spouse back out of spite and out of judgment just to get them back to show them who's boss or something. That would be our attitude. But he is saying here, God's telling Hosea, listen, I want you to show love to Gomer. Show love. Buy her back out of love, not spite. Buy her back out of love not judgment. We read on. Hosea 11. God says this, How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How? How can I make, how can I make you like Zebulun? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is around. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. So, so when Hosea is mentioning these, these cities and, that I just read, and he talked about the, the city of, of Adma and the other ones they had on him, you know what those cities were? <laughs> Those were cities that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's basically saying, I, I can't do that again. I, I, I am not going to do that again. I will not come against these folks again. And, and I think we, we sometimes in our minds go back to, to these stories, like the Sodom and Gomorrah stories, and, and we, we sort of make a general proclamation about the Bible. And, and as we're reading through it, you probably can make a little justification of saying, okay, it looks sort of me like that I'm reading a lot of judgment from God in the Old Testament. And you can't wait to get to the New Testament. I know I've already heard you. All right? I know you can't wait to get to the New Testament. Because the New Testament, we, we, we get to see Jesus. We, we even see grace personified in the New Testament. Praise God. We finally get to see this grace in the form of Jesus and how he treats people and treats his disciples. But if we are so missing, we are so missing the point if, if we do that, if we overgeneralize, because when we look at the Old Testament, you know what we see? We see grace upon grace before Golgotha. Over and over again, God had that unbroken love from a broken heart. Consequences, yes, but the love was never broken. It was always there. Grace upon grace. Do, do you have eyes to see it? Can you see it? Because if you, if you read, and you've been reading, how many times do we see in 
any, almost any book that you see this, any, any book that you read so far, there's going to be some place in there where God says, return to me. Repent. Come home. It's there. It's there over and over again if you only have eyes to see that He is offering grace upon grace long before Golgotha. God continues, continues to offer unbroken love from a broken heart. It, it has been there from the very, very beginning and continues through today. Because for some reason, for some reason that only God knows, He continues to choose us. God continues to choose you and me. Period. There's no caveat to that, right? God chooses us. There's no disclaimer. Which means He chooses us no matter what we've done. No matter, no matter how many times we've broken the covenant, God still chooses us. Because that is unbroken love from, an unbroken, from a broken heart. And here's the deal. We do break His heart. We continue to break the covenant. We break the covenant every time we put anything before Him. We break the covenant. We, we break the covenant when we cease to give Him the 10% He calls for. We break the covenant. We break the covenant when He gets the leftovers in our day. We break the covenant when we shatter the vows of our marriages. We break His heart. But He still chooses us. Because He's coming from an unbroken love from that broken heart. That's how He's coming to us.